This is a $19 million yacht named the Neverland. It sleeps 12 people plus staff. The thing is literally a mansion on water, and it has an infinity pool on the top of the yacht in case you can't find a, a place to swim while on this literal boat on the water. Now, a lot of the branding in this ad for the yacht says Namaste, and that's because that was the name of this yacht. The reason the Namaste yacht is now the Neverland yacht is because it changed owners. And it changed owners thanks to a deal orchestrated by none other than Republican congressman and serial liar George Santos. Tonight, the New York Times reports that Santos' involvement in the yacht sale is one of about a dozen leads being pursued by the FBI, the U.S. Attorney for Brooklyn, and the Nassau County DA as they look into Mr. Santos' mysterious finances. Congressman Santos denies any wrongdoing, but on its face, this does not look good. Santos brokered the yacht sale between two of his wealthy donors, and Santos has previously bragged to reporters about getting referral fees of anywhere between $200,000 and $400,000 from brokering $20 million yacht sales, which, at worst, begs the criminal question of whether this $19 million yacht sale was designed to inject more money into Santos' campaign than is allowed by campaign finance law, or, at best, whether Santos used his campaign to brush shoulders with the elite and, in turn, enrich himself. So, that was the first alleged Republican yacht financial crime story today. But there's actually another one. You might remember this $28 million yacht, the Lady May. You are likely to remember it mostly because it is the mega yacht that Trump strategist Steve Bannon was arrested on in 2020. Bannon was arrested on that yacht for allegedly defrauding investors in his We Build the Wall campaign, the one that aimed to crowdsource the building of Trump's wall on the Mexican border. Bannon's business partners in that scheme have all either pleaded guilty or been convicted of siphoning hundreds of thousands of dollars from that campaign. But Bannon himself got off thanks to a pardon from President Trump. Now, it turns out that boat, the yacht that Bannon was arrested on, the Lady May, that yacht itself was also allegedly bought, and bought with ill-gotten gains by this guy. The owner of that yacht, the fugitive Chinese billionaire Guo Wengui, Wengui. He was arrested this morning on charges that he also defrauded investors in his conservative business. In addition to the yacht, the Justice Department alleges that Guo invest, used defraud investors to buy a 50,000-square-foot mansion, a $3.5 million Ferrari, and not one but two $36,000 mattresses. Because why not buy two? If you have been awake at all in the past eight years, you know how influential Steve Bannon has become in the Republican Party. But it's really worth noting how influential this guy, Guo Wengui, has become in conservative politics alongside Steve Bannon. Part of Guo's alleged fraud was convincing people to invest more than $450 million in a media venture of his called GTV, but then pocketing tons of that money himself. Beyond the grift, GTV pushed disinformation about stuff like vaccines and election fraud and QAnon. And pivotally, it spread that disinformation on Spanish and Chinese language social media right here in America. All with well-paid consulting help from Steve Bannon. So Guo and Bannon are also the founders of the anti-Chinese Communist Party law lobbying group, the New Federal State of China, which, among other things, was one of the official sponsors of CPAC, as in the Conservative Political Action Conference. So lots of Republican figures in the same boat tonight, or boats, the alleged financial crime boat. Turns out it's a lot bigger than we thought. It's kind of a mansion on the water. The word is woke, but what do conservatives think it means? Would you mind defining woke? Because it's come up a couple times, and I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So, I mean, woke is sort of the idea that um, I. This is going to be one of those moments that goes viral. I mean, woke is something that's very hard to define, and we've spent an entire chapter defining it. It is sort of the understanding that we need to re -to totally reimagine and re re redo society in order to create hierarchies of oppression. Hard to define. Redo society. Something about oppression.
Bethany Mandel is a conservative commentator and an author who has studied wokeism and written, in her estimation, entire chapters on it. And yet, sure, it is tricky. So far, the only person to define what woke actually is is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Late last year, his staffers were asked to define woke in court. His communications director defined woke as a slang term for activism, progressive activism. His general counsel added that woke is the belief that there are systemic injustices in American society and the need to address them. Which sounds right, maybe even sort of sensible. Maybe that's why the anti-woke movement has such a hard time with it. Sometimes it's what you don't say that speaks volumes. In December, it was about parental rights. A federal judge in Texas ruled that a grant program designed to provide birth control to kids from low-income families was unconstitutional because that program violated parental rights. The judge wrote, the court finds no compelling governmental interest justifies defendants' disregard of plaintiffs' parental rights in this case. In November, it was about discrimination on the basis of sex. That same federal judge sided with lawyers associated with former Trump advisor Stephen Miller. The judge decided that Obamacare's and Title IX's ruling against discrimination on the basis of sex did not protect LGBTQ plus patients from discrimination, thereby enabling doctors to deny patients gender affirming care. In 2021, it was about irreparable harm to liberty interests. The same Texas judge blocked the Biden administration from requiring COVID vaccines for Texas hospital and nursing home staff. He cited the Fifth Circuit in asserting a public interest in maintaining the liberty of individuals to make intensely personal decisions according to their own convictions. All of the reasons this judge gave for those rulings sound like arguments that could be made in favor of protecting reproductive rights. But instead, all of these rulings were in favor of conservative interests, and they were all written by Trump-appointed judge Matthew Kaczmarek. Conservatives' lawyers have described Kaczmarek as a textualist, a jurist who sticks closely to the text of the law and the Constitution. Kaczmarek has ties to the conservative Federalist Society that date back to his law school years when he attended meetings. And now he's a headliner. Between 2015 and last month, Kaczmarek spoke at 10 Federalist Society events. Members of his family have painted a picture of him as a man with deep religious convictions, particularly when it comes to pregnancy. When he was a college student at Abilene Christian University, he wrote a column for his school paper endorsing a Republican Party platform that would support fetal personhood. He wrote, the Democratic Party's ability to condone the federally sanctioned eradication of innocent human life is indicative of the moral ambivalence undergirding this party. Perhaps more than any other national institution, the Liberal Democratic Party and its ideological affiliates have facilitated the demise of America's Christian heritage. That perspective on the demise of America's Christian heritage is echoed in a 2015 article Kaczmarek wrote against same-sex marriage. He wrote that the sexual revolution sought public affirmation of the lie that the human person is an autonomous blob of silly putty, unconstrained by nature or biology, and that marriage, sexuality, gender identity, and even the unborn child must yield to the erotic desires of liberated adults. Before becoming a judge in 2019, Matthew Kaczmarek worked on anti-abortion issues as deputy general counsel for the religious liberty law firm First Liberty. That is the man Donald Trump nominated to the federal bench. During his nomination hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Richard Blumenthal asked Kaczmarek about the place religious convictions should have in a courtroom. Do judges ever apply their religious convictions in the course of making decisions on the bench, district court judge included? They should not. Do you believe they do? Uh, Senator, in working in the private government and nonprofit sector, I can't recall an instance where I observed a judge uh, imposing their religion, but I will state for the record that it is inappropriate for an Article Three judge to do so. That was the response given by the man who in the coming days will decide a case that could upend access to one of the drugs used in medication abortions nationwide. No matter what the FDA does or the Biden administration does, 
what the impact looks like on the ground is going to be incredibly, incredibly dangerous for women because of the chaos yeah. that is it's going to sow. Well, so what? Okay, so walk me through. If we, he does hand down a preliminary injunction, the Biden administration, the DOJ is going to appeal this, right? And does this go to the Supreme Court, do you think? Well, there are a lot of things that could be done. The FDA could say, you're right, we didn't do this. We didn't do the right protocols. We've got to review this some more, even though it was reviewed for 20 years in Europe before it was approved here in 2000. But yeah, we'll do some review. And that could just be pending. We could be like, and maybe medication abortion would be available in that circumstance because the FDA is pending. But what we ultimately may have is a clash between the agency itself and this federal judge. And that's harder to say. And it's exactly as Jessica said, in a situation like that, where you have these two very powerful entities clashing, the administrative state and the judiciary on the one hand, what you have is confusion. And doctors won't know yeah, if they should exactly. provide, provide it. Uh, pharmacists won't know if they should dispense it. And women won't know if it's available. And that's exactly what they want. That's the point. A landscape of utter confusion and chaos, which is more effective perhaps than any ban at this point. Well, and w w we showed that, uh, maybe we can pull it back up, that map from the Guttmacher Institute that shows the states that are going to be affected by this chaos, Jessica. And it's not just what you think of as deep red states. It's Colorado. It's Vermont. It's New Hampshire. I mean, is the expectation that, you know, the chaos will seem less chaotic in states where there is a more progressive attitude towards reproductive choice? Or, I mean, what options are there? I would like to think so, but I am really nervous about what is going to happen on the ground when you're talking about individual doctors who have a lot of reasonable fear, individual pharmacists who were already seeing refuse medication, right, even before this decision comes down. And so I am really worried. And that's why every time I talk about this issue in my newsletter, I tell everyone who can get pregnant should have abortion medication in their medicine cabinet. You can get it whether you're pregnant or not. It's called advanced provision. You should have it on hand, whether it's for yourself or for a friend. Hopefully it won't come to that. I really, really do hope that. But that's just the, the idea that I we're know. at the stage of the game where People who follow this issue are saying stockpile this medication because you may not be able to get it or someone you love may not be able to get it is a terrifying handmaid's tale dystopia to imagine that America yeah. is in that place. I wonder, Melissa, you know, is there anything the Biden administration should or can be doing at this juncture to urge the FDA not to abide Kazmarek's ruling? I mean, what can the White House do in this? Well, I mean. This was a drug that was reviewed. It was reviewed by the FDA, it was approved by the FDA, and it was done so after 20 years of other testing in Europe. And it has a record here in the United States of 23 years of safe use. And I think the administration can lean on that. I mean, to the extent that there needs to be a new review procedure, well, fine, but we have the evidence. And this, again, is playing with women's lives. Like, this is really all this is. It's a, a, a brinksmanship, a game of brinksmanship with women in the balance. As we speak, the future of the FDA as the highest authority in the country for ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of drugs, that authority is at risk. That is because inside that courtroom in Amarillo, Texas, anti-abortion groups are asking federal judge Matthew Kaczmarek to force the FDA to rescind its approval of mifepristone, a safe and effective abortion medication that has been used in the U.S. for more than 20 years. Now, we don't know how the judge will rule, but this case has already opened the door to two very serious questions. One, what is the role of the courts in reviewing the FDA's approval of drugs? And secondly, what are the implications for other drugs being taken off the market because conservatives find them controversial? In Florida, for example, Governor Ron DeSantis has launched a public health policy committee to counter public recommendations from the FDA and the CDC on COVID vaccines. Vaccines that were approved by the FDA have been safely administered to over 269 million Americans and have shown to reduce the spread of COVID and the risk of severe illness and death. In Idaho, Republican lawmakers are going even further. They introduced a bill last month that would criminalize the administration of mRNA vaccines, as in all types of mRNA vaccines, not just those for COVID. And that could include FDA-approved drugs with mRNA technology like vaccines for rabies or the flu. And then there are the 97 bills in 27 states that would ban gender-affirming care. And that includes hormone therapy, which, by the way, is also commonly used in menopause. And then finally, there are Republican efforts to target birth control. In 2021, conservative Republicans in the Missouri legislature tried to block Medicaid funding from going to groups, including Planned Parenthood. 
In the fine print, the lawmakers further targeted specific forms of emergency contraceptives, often sold under the name Plan B. It is a medication that was approved by the FDA back in 1999. If a Texas judge sides with conservative groups to block the use of a drug that has been safely used for over 20 years, what is to say that any drug that runs afoul of conservative principles stays safely on the shelf? Joining us now is New York Times columnist and MSNBC contributor Michelle Goldberg. Michelle, it's always good to see you. And I, I don't want to be an alarmist here, right? I don't want to say the sky is falling. But the precedent that this Kazmarek case could set if he does, in fact, order a preliminary injunction or withdrawal of the FDA's approval of mifepristone could be profound across pharmacies across the country. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, besides the impact, the immediate impact on you know, women and people who need abortions. It's just the, there's, there's a couple pieces. There's the utter lawlessness of it, right? I mean, I think that the, when the Supreme Court refused to, um, enjoin Texas from their abortion bounty act, SB8, which, you know, was such a violation of what was constitutional precedent at the time. That, that the, just for those who aren't that familiar, that's the one that effectively criminalizes the act of helping someone seek or get an abortion. Right. And it was such a kind of a blatant end run around Roe, which at the time was law of land. And there was, it was so, it, the, it, the legal arguments for it were so outrageous. And the Supreme Court basically said, we don't care. Um, I think it shocked a lot of people, even pro-choice people who were very cynical about the Supreme Court, thought, well, they can't possibly allow that to stand. But it was really a sign, I think, that kind of all bets are off, you know, that they that these people have been put into these various um, courts to do the bidding of the far right, and that's what they're going to do, and the legal arguments are almost irrelevant. And, you know, if they're irrelevant for abortion... I wouldn't be surprised if they were irrelevant if they try to bring up a case against Plan B. I think it's it's also interesting to note that they have been one of the anti-abortion side's arguments uh, in this case before Kaczmarek is about um, the Comstock laws, you know, those old laws that used to ban, that were used to ban um, the mailing of. mailing of contraception, the mailing of birth control, just information. You know, they basically want to sort of resurrect the Comstock laws and say that they apply here. And, you know, there's a lot more, there's, there's many things besides abortion pills that the Comstock laws could apply to. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's coming at this particular moment where the right is emboldened by the Dobbs decision, right? The Kaczmarek ruling could have a profound effect on how they see the courts as tools to do what they can't do legislatively. And I wonder if you think, I mean, given the zeal that the right has to punish and marginalize members of the LGBTQ community in particular, it, it concerns me when I think about this landscape that, oh, drug therapies that are used specifically specifically in transition or hormone therapy or gender affirming care, that feels like it's ripe for at least some kind of lawsuit, if not a an actual legal success here, to get that stuff out of doctor's offices, out of pharmacies, where it's helping people who need it. Right. And one of the questions here is whether the um, whether states can just kind of disregard or overrule the FDA. I mean, one of the consequences of Dobbs has just been this total fracturing of the legal landscape, where you cross a state border and you're in a totally different legal regime when it comes to your body. And so, yes, well, I think we'll see, we're already seeing states banning um, hormone therapy, you know, not just for minors, but for, you know, people 18, 20, 21. I think that for the same reason that misoprostol, the second drug in the, in the medication abortion regimen, is a little bit safer than mifepristone because it has other uses, you cells use for ulcers. The same, I think, is true of the drugs that are used in transition. That's the, insurance, that's the insurance policy. Right, that, you know, puberty blockers are given to kids who have premature puberty. That's what they were originally developed for. Um, hormones are used for, you know, aging. Um, for aging, menopausal right. women. Right, you know, so whether actually Republicans are going to want to ban um, testosterone when <laughs> presumably some of them uh, are That's the golden it, ticket. That's, that's, I think, is the question. But it's also reflective of this very, very distressing trend of the courts denying settled science, right? I mean, I think we can't, like the FDA approved this, th these drugs. They are safe. They are effective. There are case studies to prove that. There is a wide body of evidence. And yet you have these Christian fundamentalist justices who seem to want to throw 
science away in the name of Christian doctrine. Well, look, I think it's been a very long history on the far right of creating these alternative institutions, alternative legal institutions, alternative medical institutions, you know, this whole sort of library of lies that, you know, kind of, you know, not just settled science on vaccine cell science on evolution. There's a whole alternative reality that they have been very fastidiously constructing and have now are now in a position to impose on everyone else. It's not just legislatures. It's now the judges themselves.